Section 21 of Atlantic Narratives, Modern Short Stories, published 1918 by the Atlantic Monthly Press. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Legacy of Richard Hughes by Margaret Lynn. Recording by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Part one. Rachel Marquis paused a moment with her hand on the library door. She had had John placed in here because it was the room she herself loved best, and she knew it was here she would prefer to sit beside him in these last hours of waiting. Yet she had hesitated to come down, and even now, with her hand on the doorknob, she lingered again to re-strengthen herself before entering. The very unusualness of an unfamiliar sight in the familiar room would add, she knew, to the sharp strangeness of the whole event. She almost hoped, as she waited this moment, for another practical duty of some sort which would postpone again her entrance to the room. But no sound came from any part of the silenced house, and she opened the door and entered. The long casket stood awkwardly across the blank fireplace, for she had chosen to give no direction to the undertaker, and he had followed his own professional judgment. Everything was arranged, however, with a sort of intention which indicated the intrusion of the professional into the private. In spite of the stronger feeling of the moment, Rachel Marquis noticed this with sharp disapproval. But she went directly to the chair which had been placed beside the casket and seated herself, bowing her head long on her folded arms before she looked on the familiar face beside her. It was now only twenty-four hours since the strange accident had happened, and she had not yet adjusted herself even so far as to determine her fundamental emotion. It was grief, of course, but the kind or degree of that grief was still undefined. The hours since they had brought him home had been so full of the unfamiliar practical things which arise at such a time, of the sudden necessities and small perplexities which muddle and chafe sorrow, that there had been scarcely a moment for her to look consciously at the great fact. Even now, as she covered her eyes, to be the more alone with herself, she felt rather a welcoming of momentary inactivity than the relaxation of grief. She realized with a sort of pang of disapproval that she did not need to relax from any tension of anguish. She did not know what she wished to say to herself in this communion. She was sorry, bitterly sorry. But what elements went into the making of that grief, she could not yet tell. So she leaned with covered eyes, almost as if she were waiting for something outside of herself to give her a cue. As the minutes passed, however, the great simple fact that John was dead, and that his place beside her would now be empty, engrossed all supplementary feeling, and her genuine regret had its way. She wept long, and even more bitterly, absorbed as one may be in the mere physical expression of grief. The activity of sorrow overcame thought for a time, and left her no energy for analysis of feeling. Death alone seemed enough to weep over, and her tears still fell. At last, as if having reached a natural period, she rose and moved away to the window and sat down there, in a quiet reverie of sadness. She was sorry for the life cut off, shocked at the abruptness and completeness of the tragedy. John himself, she was sure, the assertive, energizing John, would have hated this sudden subduing of himself, and she sympathized with such revolt. Sorry, sorry for it all. As she thought, she looked gravely out across the garden, the gay stretch to which John had given so much time. She had never understood his devotion to that garden. He had not been ready to spend money on things to give aesthetic pleasure in the house, although in practical matters he had been willing enough to make outlays ever since his business had been secure. She thought of their new car, of the signs of prosperity in their living. Poor John, she said at last with a deep sigh, when aware of the nodding line of rare dahlias on which her eyes were resting, she thought of all the pains he had taken in the propagation and selection of them. She had come to recognize this lavishness of care and money as a sort of blind expression of the one aesthetic element in his nature, and had felt a quiet approval of it. 
poor john she sighed again and turned from the window to go but even as she did so the simplicity of her mood passed and the old complexity of feeling returned with a keenness which was for the moment bewildering as she left the window the long black shape across the fireplace confronted her again and she paused startled anew it was so strange and so tremendous a thing in her room for the library was above everything else in the world hers it was such a room as shows it has been taking on character through succeeding decades cumulative of its type slowly drawing to itself an atmosphere of fineness and greatness the credit of it belonged only remotely to rachel marquis she was the possessor but not the maker of it she had kept it and loved it but her own contribution to it had been slight a few shelves of new books not yet mellowed down to the tone of the others standing as if waiting to be proved and a bit of renewing of texture here and there whose freshness showed need of the softening of time were the only marks of her hand or taste but it was such a room as any lover of the long effects of books would cherish in the midst of its harmonies the heavy black box undoubtedly looked harsh and intrusive rachel recognized as a sort of confidence with herself that bringing it here was an invasion because she loved the room herself she had placed john here without thought of the inappropriateness of the act but now the incongruity of the choice struck her why should he be brought here she thought pitifully to the room he never frequented where she scarcely welcomed him she acknowledged why should she sit beside him here when she had so seldom done so before she remembered very well the manner with which he occasionally sought her here tentative unfamiliar and yet assertive she had resented every element of that manner anywhere else in the house he was more nearly himself here everything she did not desire in him was accentuated it had been she thought with an instinctive desire to do the best for him in every way that she had directed that he should be placed here just as she had ordered everything of the choicest and had given her most careful attention and taste to every detail but this thought had been a failure poor john she said gently once more with a pity in her thought all the greater for this very incongruity as she came over and stood beside him but as her eyes rested on his face she felt almost compelled to withdraw the phrase the dead man seemed to allow no such pity the unfamiliar in the familiar which is stranger than a new thing held her startled attention as she looked she had thought she knew john marquis to the last shred of his character but death seemed to have laid a fineness she had never known over the stubbornness and taciturnity of the face the dignity of the last great experience of his life seemed to mark him he seemed to be gathering himself away from her pitying kindness very soon she went out again and closed the door part two when richard hughes the last of his family left his mother's old home to john and rachel marquis no one had wondered rachel was a sort of cousin and john too a distant connection by somebody's marriage and they lived in the town and nothing was more natural than that he should give them a home there and whatever else he had to leave what no one knew but rachel was that richard hughes had wished to marry her and that she had refused him and chosen john marquis instead richard hughes fifteen years her senior quiet and inexpressive shut in with books and remote from life was far less to her mind than john marquis who was of her own generation with whom she went to parties and talked the light talk of youth and had a thousand things in common as she thought john was bright and jolly and played tennis and danced with her and took her out in a canoe and was sweet-tempered and loved to laugh and in between times talked seriously about the business he was starting and the money he expected to make john belonged to the whole format of her life at that time and it was perfectly natural to choose to marry him with the expectation that life would go on as she and john had both known it and liked it in other homes comfortable sensible ambitious of practical things real as their kind would call it it seemed an impossible thing for her not to marry john 
in the first years of their marriage, she was proud of coming quickly to understand John's business. She was proud of her management and her well-timed economies, proud that John could talk affairs over with her with satisfaction, that she was beginning to take the place her mother and other successful women had taken in practical life. But after two or three years had passed, the space taken by practical things in her life began to shrink. Her familiarity with them detracted from their interest and allowed her to dispose of them more readily. She began to feel a restlessness which called for new interests. At the same time, John's affairs were not prospering. Difficulties he could not manage hampered him. All Rachel's advice and economies were of little help among the inevitable conditions of the time. She was becoming tired of the continual efforts to acquire, and impatient of the atmosphere of practical things. But she made a show of readiness when he suggested that they give up the cheerful modern home they had fitted about themselves, with the conventions of comfort and the furnishings and decorations to which they had been adapted. It was just at this time that Richard Hughes left them his home and the little money he owned. Nothing could have been more opportune for them. Whatever other feelings John may have had were absorbed in sheer relief at the assistance the bequest brought him. The money, with that from the sale of their own house, tidied him over his difficulties and even helped to develop his business further. Rachel concealed her reluctance at moving into the out-of-date old house with its antiquated furnishings and made a show of welcoming their fortune as a good partner should. She could hardly tell when the consciousness of the house began to have its influence upon her. From the first, John, absorbed in business, left all practical things to her, feeling that the house was more hers than his anyway. She, in a mood of vague compunction and desire to compensate for she hardly knew what, made it a point of honor to dispose of all their own furniture, chosen with such satisfaction and complacency, and settled among the dull tones and quiet spaces of the old house. "'Gay old place, isn't it?' said John, walking through the house after they were established. Rachel assented with a cheerful smile. "'Oh, well,' he went on, settling down with his trade journals, which looked sadly out of place in the dim library. "'We can stand it for a while. Sometime we can have what we want again.' It was months before he recurred to the subject directly. Then, one Sunday, he looked about him as he stretched in an old easy chair and said abruptly, "'We are getting pretty well settled down here. I didn't think the old place would be so comfortable.' "'It is more than comfortable,' said Rachel quietly. "'I wonder why Richard ever left it to us. Have you ever figured it out?' "'Oh, he had no nearer relatives that he knew.' Rachel tried to speak in a matter-of-fact way, but instead she hesitated and flushed a little. John looked at her closely. "'Do you know any other reason?' he asked curiously. Rachel hesitated again. Mere reticence on past affairs was one thing. Positively keeping a secret from her husband was another. "'Richard wanted to marry me once,' she said. "'But I don't think that had anything to do with it,' she added hastily. "'When was that?' "'Oh!' "'Before I was engaged to you,' said Rachel, and smiled at him. John said nothing more, but sat tapping his knee with his folded newspaper, as was his habit when in thought. Presently he rose and strolled away. Rachel could not help resenting his silence, which left her in discomfort. When so much had been said, he should have said more, if only to put her at her ease. For days afterwards she expected him to return to the subject, and when he did not do so, she continued to resent the implication he seemed to be making. At this time the house itself had already begun to have its effect upon her. Rachel could hardly tell when she stopped looking wistfully at the sectional bookcases and mission furniture of her acquaintances. But soon after she moved into it, the house had ceased to be, to her, merely a house. With her conventionally modern notions of beauty in furnishings, she had first been surprised to find how at rest and how satisfied she was in this house, which had met in a generous way the needs and tastes of another generation, but met few of those to which she had been trained. She had not known that it was in her to find charm in such a house, but from the time when she first became aware of the positive quality of the place, she became more and more awake to its existence. She wondered at it, but it held her attention constantly more firmly. At last she found that behind the entity of the house lay that which had made it, the personality of the generations gone, and especially of its last owner. 
the quality of the whole place, with its solidity of walls and generosity of room, along with its plain sincerity in every detail, seemed to indicate praiseworthiness, not only in the first builder, but in all later possessors. It became a meritorious thing to have and to keep a house like this. She remembered something of the sacrifices that Richard Hughes had made to retain it, and warmed with pride of him at the recollection. The whole place reflected him and the people who had made him. Gradually, Rachel grew in pride of the house and of her heritage. As she lived there month by month, she found herself enveloped in its atmosphere and growing toward its proportions. At first, she entered the library with timidity and an uncomfortable strangeness. Even one who had only very superficial intellectual tastes must have felt a sort of awe before its accumulation of books and their accompaniments. When Rachel and John had first begun to make a home, they had placed the making of a library among their ambitions for it, and had taken pleasure in adding a few gaily bound novels each year to the small united collection which they had begun. They had enjoyed seeing their few shelves grow, and knowing that they had so many of the popular books of which their friends talked. When they came to the Hughes home, Rachel had crowded their party-colored collection into the shelves of the library there, weeding out others to make room for their own. But on a later day, as she re-entered the room, she felt a shock at the incongruity presented, and, to John's puzzlement, gathered their own books into a corner by themselves where a curtain safely hid them. Their garish triviality had no place among these mellowed, long-tried volumes. John, however, had looked the old volumes over and pronounced them a dry lot. Give him something fresher. But Rachel perceived that there had been something in the choosing of these books which she had never really known. To her, books had been an accessory, an incidental thing, hypothetically an enrichment of life, but not an essential. She had thought of intellectual exercise as an intermittent thing, to be taken up or laid down as suited the mood of the time. But here was a people who chose books not merely as a desirable possession and ornamental furnishing, but as an unquestioned necessity. Gradually, as she continued to handle and know their books, she evoked for herself the earlier presences of the house, most of all Richard Hughes. In the long hours which she now spent alone about the house, she found herself living more constantly in the companionship with those minds. They were not only an atmosphere, but sometimes almost a positive presence. It entertained her to go over the books one by one, sometimes deciding who had chosen this one and that one, and for what reason, and picturing the occasion of its coming to his hand. As her knowledge of the library grew, she took more and more pleasure in this, tracing the taste of one owner or another in the recurrence of a subject or in successive accretions. She, as she learned, glowed over her collection of first editions of modern works, since they had been chosen not as first editions, but in their own time, as works for which an appreciative hand was eagerly waiting. And since Richard Hughes was the only one of her predecessors in the library whom she had known, she found herself embodying all the others in him. She knew him now better than she had ever known him. She could detect his additions to the treasures of the house, and, as her own knowledge increased, could trace his using of the resources which had been handed down to him. She began to take pleasure in following what she thought had been his path, in taste and knowledge, gradually matching her mind to his own. Her pride in the room went through successive stages. In her first days of satisfaction in mere proprietorship of so respectable and worthy a possession, she took pleasure in unostentatious exhibition of it. She liked to take guests there, in a natural sort of way, and to be found sitting there by unexpected callers. She liked the eminently admirable background of the rows of books for social episodes. But as her knowledge of the library grew, that stage passed. As she went from familiarity to intimacy, she began to desire that it should be an exclusive intimacy. 
she no longer took callers to the room and when familiar acquaintances found their way there she was uneasy at their handling of the books and impatient of their discussion of them she now seldom spontaneously took strangers there in time she had come to group john with all the others the only companionship that she desired in the library was an imagined one john's attitude had more and more set her apart in this companionship his dislike for the house had grown steadily more obvious as the months and years passed it showed itself in a lack of home pride in open contempt for the old-fashioned elements of the place in reluctance to make even necessary expenditure upon it but rachel herself had hardly guessed the strength of his feeling until one day when she discovered among richard hughes's papers what seemed to be a memorandum for a codicil to his will which would make a gift of a thousand dollars to a little public library of the town she took the note directly to john i think we ought to do this she said john looked at the paper and laid it down i don't see that we're obliged to he answered shortly it is what he intended to do and we got the money she said with too patient a manner as if explaining the moral point to him we should give it in his name it is enough to have to live in richard hughes's house i don't care to set up a memorial for him besides but john she urged herself to argue is it honest there is more than one kind of honesty said john shortly in a tone which checked further answer i can't afford it he added after a moment as the final word she left him in an anger which it seemed to her she would feel all her life but gradually it became less an act of feeling than a part of all her unformulated opinion of him he had not followed her a single step in the development which had resulted from her awakening to the spirit of the house in time he came to ignore the library altogether as part of the house and by degrees fitted up an incongruous little lounging place upstairs rachel came to regard his whole attitude toward the place and the man who had owned it as belonging to his mental and aesthetic plane his jealous ingratitude seemed not a separate feeling but only an element of his character richard hughes she now understood very well had known her very little and had loved only her prettiness and light girlishness charms which were different from anything in his own life the recollection of that episode did not flatter her now or even afford her any special gratification but she loved to live side by side with the embodiment she had recreated for herself and was proud to feel her spirit matching its spirit she sometimes felt with her growing imagination that she was living in the house not with john but with these presences of the past most of all with richard hughes but in the meantime the matter of the bequest assumed for her constantly greater proportions after some time had passed she ventured to mention it again he answered as before i can't afford it she knew that he could afford it about the same time he bought a strip of ground lying beside them and began his garden rachel suggested that he take a piece of their own grounds but he bluntly rejected the proposal a growing taciturnity marked his manner and often a willful crudeness of phrase and speech which annoyed her almost to the point of reproof so far as was possible however she kept the recognition of all this far in the background of her thought and forbore any conscious criticism of him even to herself but her warmest feeling for him was tinged with pity yesterday he had been taken this accident sudden as a lightning flash and more unforeseen had ended the relation between them though not the puzzle rachel had never been one to revise her opinion of a man because he was dead her tears had fallen now but she had no compunctious self-deception and her long-framed feelings were only complicated not really altered she saw as clearly as ever the incongruity of her husband's presence in this room where richard hughes had had his life and where she now had her own part three all waited for the coming of john's brother david marquis david was an elder brother retired from business on some pretext or other now loitering his way profitably and pleasantly through the latter half of his life it had been his custom to visit them frequently spending weeks at a time idling about the house quiet keen of look ready to talk with interest on any general topic 
but incommunicative of opinion on any personal matter rachel had always felt as she saw his observant eye first upon john and then upon her that he saw the difference between them and sympathized with her for this reason although she had never criticized john to him she had sometimes spoken freely of herself and of her own tastes and wishes and he had listened quietly as ever but responsively she had a sort of feeling now that she would find her poise through him when he came a sympathetic eye would help her to adjust the degree of her grief to the limits of her previous feeling it was eight o'clock when he arrived the pretext of dinner in the house was over and even the neighborly and professional attentions of the day were withdrawn rachel descended from her room in the quiet house at the sound of his entrance and met gratefully the brotherly kindliness of his manner they sat a few minutes in the hall in question and answer of his journey and of the accident and all the circumstantial things which cluster about death itself rachel answered freely and fully discovering a relief in breaking the instinctive repression of the day and finding the sort of rest she had hoped for from his presence david listened to her quietly as he had always done with his ready eye upon her at last he rose turning away from her with a comprehensive look about him where is he he asked abruptly in the library said rachel with a movement to lead the way for him in there exclaimed david with the emphasis of surprise then he closed his lips again and followed her without meeting her questioning look but inside the door he paused again rachel had constrained by long habit looked first at the room as she entered and then at the casket as a separate thing the room had so long served to give her poise that she felt a sort of appeal to it even now david's eyes rested first on the casket and then swept the room in a disapproving look why is he here he asked with a curtness in his easy voice which rachel had never heard from him before why she began hesitatingly and then added vaguely it seemed best best for him responded david with the same curtness then he turned and dropped his head slowly over the figure in the coffin and rachel slipped away David's manner seemed to put her entirely outside of the occasion. Later he joined her where she waited for him in the dim parlor. The still chilliness of the room was stiffening and depressing, but she had not made a fire because its open cheerfulness would not have seemed appropriate. David walked up and down the long room a few minutes in silence, which Rachel, not knowing his mood, did not break. Then he said, as abruptly as before, "'Can you have him moved in the morning?' moved where rachel had not supposed that her brother-in-law would have the same feeling of incongruity that she had anywhere but there here i don't know there is no place in the house that seems to belong to him the hall might do at least he went through there every day he finished with an irony none too subtle he began to walk up and down the length of the room alternately facing her with a challenging air and turning abruptly away again when he had neared her seat but rachel absorbed still in her mood was unappreciative of his manner john never fitted into the house very well anywhere she said with reserved regret fitted into it exclaimed david as he turned toward her at the end of the room my did the house ever fit into him it is the business of a house to suit the people that live in it he flung over his shoulder as he wheeled away again rachel was silent puzzled at this surprising change of manner in david and not knowing how much of his emotion was merely the impatience of grief is there a corner of the house where it is appropriate for him to lie now except the little cubbyhole of his upstairs demanded david continuing but as one who knows that an answer is impossible he suddenly abandoned his walk and came over and sat down opposite her in front of the empty fireplace he sat silent a moment his gray figure drooping in the big chair rachel looking carefully at him for the first time noted with a kind of surprise the mark of brokenness and relaxation upon him of submission to tremendous grief it had not occurred to her that john could be mourned in that way after a moment he said quietly 
this house has never been a home for john i was always hoping said rachel as if this subject were one which they had discussed before and agreed upon that he would feel more at home here in time what would have been necessary to bring that about david asked quietly well said rachel with reluctance and criticism even greater than usual he would have had to change in many ways in what ways persisted david rachel hesitated again the thing when baldly said seemed so much harsher than when it was merely held in thought john's taste was different from that of the people who made this house she said yes i know these pictures and the old books in the library and so on is that what you mean well the insides of the books and other pictures which we don't have and so on she finished indefinitely yes you thought john was crude and rather coarse of feeling oh no not that indeed you wouldn't call it just that of course but the difference between you was the same whether it put you up high or him down low isn't that so you were sorry for yourself because john was not on your level yes admitted rachel reluctantly voicing the words were you ever sorry enough for john because you were not on his level there are different kinds of lonesomeness he added after a pause i never saw a worse case than john's rachel sat upright looking at him in a sort of amazement as much at himself as at the idea she had never dreamed that behind his apparently sympathetic observation of her lay any condemnation of her attitude he met her look with one as direct and asked in a way which made the question a sort of arraignment did it ever occur to you what a tragedy john's life was rachel merely shook her head slowly as she tried to connect in an impersonal sort of way the notion of tragedy with john john the successful the obstinate the simple in desire the objective there had been no real disappointment in all his life she looked back half indignantly at david rejecting the suggestion david rose and took a turn up and down the parlor again pausing in the shadows at the farther end of the room then he came back to his seat and faced her determinedly what i had always hoped was that you would come to understand john without any outside interference i came back over and over to see but i always kept from butting in he paused again i wouldn't say anything now only your tone your poor john way shows you are just the same as ever i won't have him buried without your knowing something more about him if i could show you he added more gently please tell me said rachel quietly her mind was still half as much on david as on what he was going to say there is nothing to tell that you should not have seen for yourself you were his wife and you lived with him from the time you came to this house one side of john's life ended in a way he had no home and no wife a man wants a companion rachel almost spoke in startled contradiction it was she who had been uncompanioned you were proud i know of never finding fault with john don't you know that he would have been glad if you had openly found fault with him as it was it seemed as if you thought him hopeless when he said things about the house or anything in it he really wanted you to contradict him and argue with him and give him a way to come to the same place where you were don't you see did he tell you no but of course i used to sit around with him a good deal and i had always been used to understanding him he added with a drop in his voice john had a lot of imagination he went on rachel looked up in real surprise i could see every year how the house was getting more on his nerves sometimes when he was feeling it more than usual he would say little things that i understood for him it was like living with someone who didn't want him around but he might have liked it you don't understand said rachel as if pricked into coming to her own defense john didn't like the way the house came to us in the first place you didn't know yes i did he responded as she hesitated i found out and yet she went on we used the house and the money you haven't known much about the business for several years have you of course you do know that the house has been in your name from the beginning almost but you don't know that the few thousand richard hughes left have been invested for you ever since two years after he died 
it crippled john for a while after he took it out of the business but he always took good care of that money it amounts to quite a little now john didn't like it because richard rachel hesitated again you thought he was jealous he did that after one day when you weeded out a lot of his books and put them away in some corner and it was after he had those new york electric men here that evening and you seemed not to want to have them in the library that he bought the corner of ground over there and made his garden don't you understand rachel dropped her face upon her hands partly for relief from david's serious face which forbore to rebuke her and yet of necessity did so partly to close herself in with her own bewilderment to reconstruct john's life meant to take a new view of her own also david leaned suddenly toward her if john had been jealous wouldn't he have had a reason rachel i know you weren't untrue to him but still he felt the formulation of the thought with her i haven't judged you harshly rachel he went on in a moment but it is not right that a man's brother should know him better than his wife does i had to make you know even at the last then as if he were compelled to say the final hard thing he added wasn't there something you had already thought you should do when everything was in your hands rachel startled and flushing faced him again in involuntary confession i had always thought it would be right to carry out a plan of richard hughes's yes i know i am sure that was only a momentary notion of his he had a great habit of making notes of things his will was made only a few days before he died and that idea was probably earlier i was an executor you remember but anyway several years ago john made a large gift to the library of richard's college in richard's name he took no chances on being unfair he should have told you he added but john had a hard sort of pride to manage and i suppose he never did no said rachel he never did she rose with a sudden dropping of her hands at her sides as if relinquishing something they had held and moved vaguely toward the door don't you think pursued david that he might be brought in here or somewhere rachel hesitated her hand faltering on the door frame no she said at last let him stay there now and she herself went out through the dim chill hall she lingered a moment at the closed library door and then went slowly on up to her own empty room end of story biographical and interpretive notes by editor charles swain thomas margaret lynn member of the english department of the state university of kansas at lawrence is best known for her sympathetic appreciation of prairie life this story is a tragedy the tragedy of a wife's failure to understand the finer side of her husband's nature she learns her misjudgment all too late when the husband lies dead the emotional values are the greater because the reader inevitably contemplates the long years they lived together in their isolation the psychology of the situation is portrayed with remarkable clarity the method is very different from the method of such writers as de maupassant de maupassant's analysis and dissecting is usually done with cold and relentless indifference miss lynn's processes are here carried out determinedly but with full and lingering sympathy end of section twenty one This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Section 22 of Atlantic Narratives Modern Short Stories, published 1918 by the Atlantic Monthly Press. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Of Water and the Spirit by Margaret Prescott Montague. I want to tell you, I must tell you all about it. With a kind of grave finality, the little woman on the deck chair next to mine snapped together the collapsible drinking cup with which she had been playing and sat up, laying a small eager hand on my arm. 
It was as if her groping thoughts had suddenly pushed open a door into action. I wondered if she guessed that I had been peeping at her from under dropped lids. She had the colorless makeup of a small middle-aged mouse. But her expression was amazing. It startled and arrested one. All the old lines of the face were set to small ambitions and sordid desires, but the look which should have accompanied these lines was clean gone, wiped into something big and still and simple, and her manner was that of an earnest child. "'I was in Belgium when it commenced,' she began. "'But I guess I'd better go back and tell it all right from the beginning,' she broke off. "'Please do,' I begged. I did my best to speak naturally, but my voice seemed to break some spell, for her face blurred suddenly to self-consciousness. "'I—I I reckon I ought to apologize for speaking to a stranger,' she stammered primly, and now her words exactly matched all the old small lines of her face. It was as if her little self, aware of something big and overwhelming that threatened to sweep her out of her depth, made a desperate clutch at conventionality. "'But I want to hear,' I protested eagerly. "'Please tell me.' She must have seen that I was in earnest, for the little conventional self disappeared at that, and she answered simply, "'And I want to tell you.' "'It seems like I've just got to tell you.' It was September, 1914. We homing Americans were churning through an extraordinarily blue ocean toward New York and peace— while back there, just over our shoulders, a mad world was running red. It was like being torn all to pieces and put together again different, she said. But I'll go back, like I said, and start right from the beginning. For a moment she was silent, staring thoughtfully down at the cheap little metal cup screwing the ring softly round and round, and drawing, as it were, inspiration from the sight of it. "'I come from Johnson's Falls,' she began at length. "'You wouldn't know where that is. "'It's just a little place down in West Virginia. "'But it's right close to the Virginia state line, "'and we have some mighty nice people in town. "'Why,' she exclaimed, "'I reckon we have some of the very best blood in the South there. "'But—but but that isn't what I set out to tell you,' she caught herself up. "'She fell into such a prolonged silence, "'turning the little cup and looking at it, that at last I ventured a question to start her again. "'And I suppose,' I said, "'you belong to one of the oldest families there.' I was sorry as soon as I had said it. "'No, I don't,' she answered simply, looking straight up at me. That was how it all commenced. My father kept the livery stable, but, of course, it wouldn't matter, keeping a livery, I mean, if your family was all right. Jeff Randolph kept the grocery— being a Randolph, of course, he could. But my name's Smithson, Sadie Virginia Smithson, and my grandfather was a carpenter. I'm a dressmaker myself. That's the reason they didn't elect me to the Laurel Literary Society. She paused a moment. I reckon you wouldn't understand about the Laurel Literary Society? She questioned a trifle wistfully. Perhaps not, I admitted. Well, it's a literary society, of course— the members read papers and all like that, but it's a heap more than that. Belonging to it kind of marks a person out in Johnson's Falls and gives them the, the, well, I'd reckon you call it the entree to all the best homes in town. If you don't belong, well, I reckon it came kind of hard on me not belonging than it did on some of the others. Why, well, I'd have said the girls that started it were my very best friends. We'd played together as children, and I called them all by their first names, and they knew I was just as smart and liked reading and all that just as well as any of them did. So when I wasn't asked to join, well, it just seemed to knock me right out. I wasn't but nineteen then, and when your young things hurt more, I reckon. Anyhow, the slight of it got just fixed in my mind— and I kind of made a vow that I'd belong to that society some day if I'd died for it. And then, after a while, it came to me, maybe if I could just save money enough to go abroad, they'd ask me to read a paper before the society when I got back, cause mighty few people have traveled much from our town. Well, she looked thoughtfully away at the blue water. Many and many a night I put myself to sleep thinking how it would be when I read that paper— you know, when you're young and kind of unhappy and slighted, 
how you make up things to sort of comfort yourself i nodded well i could just see the whole thing me standing there reading and all and when i'd get through i could almost hear the applause they'd some of em have on gloves you know so it would sound softer and more genteel like than just common bare-handed clapping well it takes time for a country dressmaker to save it took me twenty years i did have most enough once but then my sister was taken sick and what i'd saved had to go for her but I just gritted my teeth and commenced again, and at last this spring I had enough, and I joined a party and went. Ours wasn't a regular party. It was just a professor and his wife who were going anyhow, and would take a couple of ladies with them, so there were just the four of us. Well, we traveled for a month or more, and you better believe I stretched my eyes to see all there was to see. And then, all at once, the world just tipped itself right over and went crazy. We were in Brussels when it came. The professor was sure everything would quiet down in a little bit, and he said we'd better stay right there. And anyhow, it wasn't easy to get away. It was all just awful, with one country after another slipping in. Only things came so quick, a person didn't have hardly time to catch their breath and think how awful, for something worse was jumping right on top of it. Well, we stayed and stayed till at last the Germans came. It certainly was a sight to see em, but I ain't going to tell about that. I'm just going to skip right along to what I set out to tell. The professor and his wife had left their only child, a mighty sickly little thing, with her grandmother in Paris, and when things got so bad they were pretty near distracted to get to her. Well, one morning the professor came in and told us he'd run across a young American, a Mr. Grenville, who was being sent to Paris on some special diplomatic business. He had a big automobile, and he thought maybe he could get it fixed to take us all, too. It looked like a mighty crazy thing to do, but there wasn't any holding the professor and his wife on account of their child. And me and the other lady, we was afraid to be left behind. Well, after a lot of running around from one official to another, they did finally get it all fixed for us to go, and the next day we started out with an American flag on the front of our car. Of course we were stopped a lot of times, and all our papers gone through and everything, but each time they let us go on account of Mr. Grenville being a United States official. We'd started early, and by noon we'd come a right smart piece, and about that time we began to hear firing on in front. Did you ever hear them big guns? She broke off to ask, her childlike eyes questioning me. I shook my head. "'Well, you needn't never want to hear em, she said. When they commenced, we all kind of looked at one another, and I reckon we was all scared. Anyhow, I know I was. Why, at home I'm afraid of a thunderstorm. But still we kept on. The sound of the firing got louder and louder, but it was never very close, and long late in the afternoon it sort of died off, and we commenced to draw breath again and think everything was going to be all right.' I'm most sure now we must have missed the way, for just about that time we ran upon a piece of road that was all tore up. There were big holes in it from the shells, and those tall poplars alongside were all snapped off, and their branches stripped down like a child peels a switch. You could smell the fresh sap like you can in lumber camps at home. Well, we had to slow up and kind of pick our way, and on round the very next turn we ran right up on them. On the fighting, I gasped. No, no, the fight was all over then. Just for a flash coming on em so quick like I didn't know what they were. They looked like little sprawled brown heaps. But in the second I was wondering, one of em flung up an arm and groaned. How awful! I cried aghast. Yes, she assented simply. It certainly was awful. My words ain't big enough to tell you how awful. Running up on em so unexpected like that kind of cut my breath right off and choked me. There they were, lying all about across the road and in a wheat field alongside, with the sun just shining down like it was any kind of a summer day. A good many of them were dead, but there were a plenty that weren't. They blocked the road so we had to stop, and right where we stopped there was a young man lying flung over on his back. He'd snatched his shirt open at the breast, and the blood had all dripped down into the dust of the road. He opened his eyes and stared right up in my face and cried, Water, for God's sake. He said it over and over in the awfulest voice, and like it was one word, 
What a for God's sake, what a for God's sake, like that. I had this little drinking cup, and there was a good-sized creek, just a piece across the field, so I grabbed my handbag and jumped out. <laughs> well, at that, all of them in the car commenced to holler and scream at me to get back. Though we couldn't stop, it wouldn't be safe, and we couldn't do anything. And anyhow, the stretcher bearers would be along directly. But I just said, he wants water, and I've got my cup here. And there's the branch, and anyhow, I says, he looks kind of like my sister's oldest boy. And with that I started on to the creek. Well, the professor and Mr. Grenville jumped out of the car and came running after me, but I just turned round and looked at him. You all go on, I says. He asked me for water, for God's sake, and if you try and put me back in that car, I'll fight you like a wild cat. I never did anything like that. Fightin', I mean, she broke off to explain earnestly. But I would have and I reckon they knew it. The professor tried to argue. "'You'll be a raving maniac if you stay here,' he says. "'Well, I says, look what's here now. What difference does it make if I am?' Somehow that was the way I felt. Everything was so awful it didn't seem to matter whether anything awful happened to me or not. So I just kept on to the creek, and Mr. Grenville said, "'For heaven's sake, let her stay if she can do anything.' I wish to God I could stay, too. But he couldn't. He was carrying some mighty important dispatches that he just had to get on with. And then he calls out to me, Good luck and God bless you, Miss Smithson. And when I looked back, he was standing with his hat off. He was a mighty nice young man. But all the time the other ladies in the car was screaming and hollering for them to come on, so they had to go. They left you all alone? I cried. They had to she returned. Mr. Grenville had to get on with his dispatches, and it was the last chance the professor and his wife had of getting through to the, their child. And the other lady, well, she couldn't do nothing but scream anyhow. By the time I was coming back from the creek, the car was just pulling out of sight. Somehow, to see it go like that gave me a kind of funny feeling. I was scared, I reckon, but all the same I felt kind of still, too. It seemed like for the last few weeks I'd been hustled along in a wild kind of torrent. But now I'd touched bottom and got my feet under me. I reckon a woman does touch bottom when there's anything she can do. Anyhow, one raised to work like I've been does. But, oh, my Lord, she cried suddenly, dropping her face to her hands. I wish I could keep from seeing it all still, and hearing it too. Did you ever hear a man scream? she demanded. Not just groan, but shriek and scream? In hospitals, I said uncertainly. I've heard people screaming when they were coming out of ether. She shook her head. That's different. You knew there were people, nurses and doctors, to do things for them. But out there there wasn't anything but the trampled wheat and the big empty sky. There was plenty of them who wanted water and begged and cried for it. But I just said, I'll be back to you all presently, and went on to the first one. He was kind of delirious, but he could drink the water and was mighty glad to get it. I brushed the flies all away and spread a clean handkerchief over his wound. He was too far gone to try and do anything else for him, and went on back to the creek. Water, that was the main thing they wanted. The most of them that could be were bandaged already. Some of the medical outfit had been around and got him tied up, but after that I reckon the fighting must have changed and cut him off from their friends. But the stretcher bearers didn't come, and didn't come. It was all so strange, and kind of shut away there, like destruction and lit for a spell, and then flown on to the next place. The wheat was all laid over and tramped, lumpy with khaki bodies, and with cats and guns and things flung around in it, and the red sun sailing down and down in the west, and every here and there awful splatters of blood in the wheat. But I didn't have time to look and think too much. And it was mighty lucky I didn't have. They were all English and had run upon a German battery and had been shot to pieces for they hardly knew what was happening. I guess some of them must have got away, but there was a plenty that didn't. They had been lying there since dawn, and and they were hungry. Her voice broke, and I didn't have anything to give them. She whispered. They say after a while you get kind of numb to things. She went on presently, with her grave simplicity. I don't know how that is, but I know the things I saw made me stop every now and then down by the creek out of sight, and just wring and wring my hands together in a kind of rage of pity. Once, 
going through the wheat, I tramped on something soft. And when I looked, it was, it was just a piece of a man. I thought I'd lay right down then and die, but I says to myself, they want water, they want water, and that way I kind of drove myself on. But all the time I could see my heart under my waist just jumping up and down like I was fighting to jump out and run away. And then another time, but she broke off. No, she said, I won't tell about that. It's so peaceful here with that blue water and sunshine and all. I reckon I oughtn't to tell what it's like underneath when hell takes the lid off, and maybe some day the Lord'll let me forget. But it's funny, she went on again presently, how your mind grabs a hold of any foolish thing to steady you. She paused, staring down at the little cup as though she drew remembrance from it. I recollect as I went back and forth, back and forth, weaving out paths through the wheat, a silly song that we used to sing to a game at school kept running my head. I don't want none of your weevily wheat, and I don't want none of your barley, and I don't want none of your weevily wheat to bake a cake for Charlie. I was mighty glad it did, for all it was so silly, it kept me from flying right off the handle. And so I kept on and on carrying him water. Some of the men thought it was funny I should be there, and they wanted to talk and ask me questions. But the most of them were suffering too bad to care, and some of them were busy going along into the next world and were done with being surprised over anything in this. Most of them called me nurse or sister, and some way I liked to have them do it. Some of them certainly were brave, too. Why, well, I saw one young fella jump straight up to his feet and fling his arms out wide and holler right up at the sky, Are we downhearted? No! And pitch over dead. You know, she paused to explain simply, her extraordinarily childlike eyes lifted to mine for understanding and sympathy. It just seemed to snatch the heart right out of you to see a person stand up to death like that, especially when they're so young, like that little fella. Of course, she went on after a moment, I didn't just give him water. I'd do any other little thing I could besides, and every time I could do anything I certainly was glad. Doing things seemed to ease up a little that terrible rage of pity I felt. I took my skirt off and rolled it up for a pillow, for a little fellow who couldn't move and was laying with his head in a kind of sinkhole. He tried to thank me, but he couldn't. He just sobbed, but he caught a hold of my hand and kissed it. That made me cry. It was so sort of young and pretty of him. After that I went on for a spell with the tears just pouring down my cheeks. But presently I found the one who couldn't drink the water, and I quit crying then. My tears weren't big enough. Only God's would have been big enough for that. The man's face was all gone. Eyes, mouth, everything. And still he was alive. He must have heard me and known somebody was there, for he commenced to scream and moan, trying to say things down in his throat, and to reach out his hands and flop about. Oh, my God, it was like a chicken with its head off. I thought I'd have to run. But I didn't. I just sort of fell down beside him, and caught hold of his hands, and patted them, and talked to him like you do to a child in a nightmare. I don't know what I said at first. Just a crazy jumble of pity, I reckon. But after a little bit I found I was praying. I know I needed it. And it seemed to help him, too, for after a little bit he stopped that awful trying to speak down in his throat, and lay still, just gripping my hands. I was so crazy I couldn't think of a thing to say, but God bless us, and keep us, and make his face to shine upon us, and be merciful unto us. And I just said that over and over. I guess it wasn't the words that he wanted, it was the feeling of having God there in all that awful dark and blood, and some human being beside him who was sorry. Anyhow, every time I'd stop, he'd snatch at my wrist so hard it would hurt. Look! She broke off to push up her grey sleeve, and there, on her thin wrist, still vividly black and blue, were the bruised prints of fingers. But I was glad to be hurt. I wanted to be hurt. I wanted to have a share in all the suffering. It just seemed like my heart would break. And, she added with great simplicity, I reckon that's just what it did do, for I know I broke through into something bigger than I ever had been. 
Well, after a while, God did have mercy on that poor soul, for he quit pulling up my hands and began to die, and when I came round again to him, he was gone. But that got me started, and I left off saying that foolishness about the weevily wheat, and said the little prayer instead. I said it to myself first, but after a little bit, I found I was saying it out loud. I don't know why, but it just seemed like I had to say it every time I gave one of them water. Just... God bless us, and keep us, and make his face to shine upon us, and be merciful unto us. It was somehow like a child's game, like having to touch every tree box going along the street, or stepping over every crack. Each one of them had to have the water and the little prayer, and then on to the next, or back down to the creek for more. Most of them didn't seem to notice, but some of them laughed, and some stared like I was crazy. Maybe I was a little— and again some of them were glad of it. So I kept on and on, and the sun went down, and the dark came, and it seemed like a kind of a lid had shut us away from all the world. It wasn't right dark, but the stars were shining. It was about that time that I found the little officer. He was dying off in the wheat all to himself, and he got me to take down some messages for his folks. I wrote them in my diary— I had a pocket flashlight in my bag, and it made a round eye of light that stared out at every word I wrote. They were the simplest kind of words. Just love. Love to mother, and love to father, and snippy, and peg, and goodbye to em all, and how he was glad to die for England. But they look mighty strange, jumping about there in my diary, alongside of travel notes about Brussels. It's like something big and terrible had smashed its fist right through all the little fancy things. But it was funny, she went on after a minute, how sort of like little children so many of the men were, so trusting and helpless. There was one little fellow always said the same thing to me every time I came round. They'll sure be around for us soon now, won't they, sister, he'd say. And I'd always answer, oh yes, just in a little bit now. And he'd settle back again, so trusting and satisfied, and like I really knew. That was the way they all seemed to me, just children, even the ones that cursed and screamed at me. Another funny thing, she added, lifting her grave child eyes to mine. I've never been married, never knew what it was to have children. But that night all those men were my children, even the biggest and roughest of them. I felt them all here. She held her hands tight against her breast, and I believe I would have died for any one of them. I reckon being so crazy with pity had stretched me up out of being a kind of scary old maid into being a mother. I recollect there were two loose horses galloping about. They were wild with fear, and they'd gallop as hard as ever they could in one direction, and then they'd wheel round and come to a stand with their heads up and their tails cocked and nicker, and snort over what they smelt, and then take out again. Well, once they came charging right down on us, and I thought sure they were going right over the men. I never stopped to think. I ran straight out in front of them, waving my arms and hollering. They just missed galloping right over me, but I didn't care. I believe I'd almost have been glad. It was like I said. I wanted to be hurt, too. That was because it was all so lonesome for them. Death and suffering is a lonesome thing, she stated gravely. When they'd scream, I felt like I'd tear my heart out to help them. But all I could do was just to stand on the outside like and watch them suffering and maybe drying inside there all alone. That's why it seemed like being hurt, too, would make it easier. But along late in the night, the guns broke out again awful loud, and presently off against the sky I saw red streaks of flame go up in two places, and I knew there were towns on fire. I just stopped still and looked, and thought what it was like with the folks scurrying round like rats, and the fire and the shells raining down on them. That's hell, right over there, I says out loud to myself, and then I went on down to the creek faster than ever. Maybe I was getting kind of light-headed then, and God knows it was enough to make anybody so. Anyhow, I felt like I had to hold hell back. It was loose right over there, and the only thing that held it off was the cup of water and the little prayer. So I kept on back and forth, back and forth from the creek, faster and faster. I thought if I missed one of them, it would let hell in on all the rest, so I kept on and on. 
the guns were booming and the flames going up into the sky and all hell was loose but the little prayer and the cup of water was holding it back and then at last when it commenced to freshen for dawn i knew i'd won she drew a deep breath and paused looking up at me with clear faraway eyes that was because i knew he was there she said he i questioned awestruck by her tone she nodded yes god she answered simply and after that that terrible lonesomeness melted all away i knew that though i had to stand outside and see him suffer he was inside there with him closer to him than they ever was to themselves so i know it wasn't really lonesome for em even if they were suffering and dying and i'm right sure that a good many of em got to know that too anyhow the faces of some of the ones that had died looked that way when i saw em in the morning maybe it was because i cared so much myself that i kind of broke through into knowing how much more god cared folks always talk like he was a father way off in the sky but i got to know that night that what was really God was something big and close, right in your own heart. There was a heap more like a big mother. And it was all bigger and sort of simpler than I'd ever thought it would be. Right over there was hell and big guns and men killing each other. But here where we were, were just stars overhead, and folks that you could do things for, and God. I reckon that's the way, she said with her grave simplicity. When things get too awful, you suffer through to God, and he turns you back to the simplest things, just the little prayer and the cup of water for men that was like sick children. This is the cup, she added, holding it out for my inspection. And, and that's all, I reckon, she concluded. When daylight came, the stretcher bearers did get through to us. There was a sort of doctor officer with them, and I never in my life saw anyone look so tired. "'Who are you, and what in thunder are you doing here?' he stormed out at me. "'Only I don't say it as strong as he did. "'I reckon I must have looked like a wild woman. "'I'd lost my hat, and my hair was all fallen down, "'and I only had on my short alpaca underskirt, "'cause I'd taken off my dress skirt to make a pillow, like I'd said. "'But I just stood right up in the midst of all those poor bodies, "'and says, "'I'm Miss Smithson, Sadie Virginia Smithson.' and I've been holding hell back all night. I knew I was talking crazy, but I didn't care, like the way you do coming out of ether. He stared at me for a spell, and then he says, kind of funny, Well, Miss Sadie Virginia, I'm glad you held some of it back, for everybody else in the world was letting it loose that night. He was mighty kind to me, though, and helped get me to one of the base hospitals, and from there over to England. But I don't know what happened to the professor and his party. Well, I ventured after a long pause, and not knowing quite what to say, the Laurel Literary Society will be glad enough to have you belong to it now. She flashed bolt upright at that, her eyes staring at me. But, but you don't understand, she cried breathlessly. I've been face to face with war and death and hell and God. I've been born again. Do you reckon any of them little old things matter now? I was stunned by the white look of her face. "'What does matter now?' I whispered at last. "'Nothing,' she answered. "'Nothing but God and love and doing things for folks. That was why I had to tell you.'" End of story. Biographical and interpretive notes by Charles Swain Thomas. Margaret P. Montague, living among the West Virginia mountains, has written many successful stories of the hill people whom she knows so well. The chain of incidents narrated by the simple-hearted Virginia dressmaker is of absorbing interest, and seems to be the real experiences of one who had actually endured the tragedy of having lived in the horror of the aftermath of battle. But even more interesting than these scenes of pitiful suffering is the effect produced upon the woman who endures it all. Her whole attitude toward life was changed. What matters it now that her father was not an aristocratic Virginian? What if she were a poor dressmaker at the little village of Johnson's Falls? What, though she was not elected a member of the Laurel Literary Society? She had been face to face with war and death and hell and God, 
the little things of life had unconsciously sunk away, and the great enduring themes had boldly emerged to recreate her spiritual self. End of section. Section 23 of Atlantic Narratives, Modern Short Stories, published 1918 by the Atlantic Monthly Press. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Mr. Squem by Arthur Russell Taylor Why do we go on perpetuating an uncomfortable breed? The man who was shaving at the mirror-panelled door of the Pullman smoking compartment looked at his questioner on the leather seat opposite. "'Give it up,' he answered. "'Why is a hen?' The first man wrapped his pipe empty on the edge of a cuspidor. "'You answer the question,' he said, "'in the only possible way, by asking another.' "'Right,' answered the shaver, and began to run the hot water." A closely built man, in a suit so heavily striped as to seem stripes before it was a suit, lurched into the compartment and settled himself to his paper and cigar. "'That monkey on a stick,' he presently broke out, "'is still taking good money away from the asses who go to hear him rant about God and hell and all the rest up in Boston. I am so damn tired of him and of that rich rough-necked freeze. It's the limit.' "'Pretty much,' said the man with the pipe. "'I was reading about the Belgians just before you came in, "'and when I jumped away from them I lit on something about Poland. "'Then I wondered aloud to this gentleman "'why we go on multiplying, increasing such an uncomfortable breed. "'Modic gods and degenerate millionaires make one wonder more.' "'What is your line, may I ask?' inquired the stripe-suited man. "'Religion.' "'The hell, I beg your pardon.' "'If you mean that you're a preacher or something like that, all I've got to say is you're a funny one. "'It's your job, isn't it, to be dead sure that everything's all right, "'or somehow going to be all right, no matter about all the must-upness? "'Yes, that's certainly your job. "'Yet here you are, asking why we go on stocking the world with kids. "'I might ask that. I'm in rubber tires, but not you. "'Yes, I might. Only I don't.' The man who had been shaving had resumed his tie, collar, and coat, and now lighted a cigarette. "'I lay my money,' he said, "'on one thing, that if men let themselves go, they wind up shortly with God, or with what would be God if there were any. You've come to it early, through the ledger. You'd have got to it sooner or later, though, if you'd been talking about hunting dogs, provided you'd have let yourselves go.' "'Well, now,' asked the closely built man, what is your line? Education. Highbrow company. Seems to me the pair of you ought to be silencers for a plain business man like me. Rubber is my line, not how the world is run. My opinion on that is small change, sure. Yet I think it ought to be run, the world, I mean, even if it's mussed up to the limit, and I think it's up to us to keep it running. The parson here, if he is a parson, asks why we should, that is, if I get him, and then I think there's a manager of it all in the central office. A manager, understand, though he never seems to show up around the works, and certainly does seem to have some of the darndest ways. The professor here, if he is a professor, doesn't sense any manager. That is, if I get him straight, with his if there were any. That was what you said, wasn't it? I'm a pick chicken on religion and education, but honest. Both those ideas would mean soft tires for me— "'Yes, sir, soft tires. "'Broad Street, gentlemen,' said the porter at the door. "'The Reverend Alan Dare walked away from the train and down the street. "'He was episcopally faced and episcopally trim, "'and he was having considerable difficulty in holding his universe together. "'This is not pleasant at forty-two, "'when you want your universe held together and things settled and calm. He had an uncomfortable sense that this difficulty had jolted into plain sight on the car. "'Ass,' he addressed himself briefly, "'to let your sag and unsettlement loose in that way, "'to say such a thing as you said, and in such a place, "'to parade your momentary distrust of life. "'Ass! Oh, ass!' He said, or thought, a prayer-book collect, one which seemed rather suited to asses, and continued, 
I suppose I'm three-tenths sag, no more, and he knoweth whereof we are made, and what a devil of a world it is to be in just now. But that rubber man on the car, he isn't sag at all. Heavens, his crudeness, his beastly clothes, and the bare-shaved welt round the back of his neck, and that awful seal-ring. But he's fastened. Life is worth pushing at and cheering for, and there's a manager. If he has the darndest ways, I'd give something for an every-minute mood like that, a carrying night and day sureness like that. He's not illuminated, lucky dog. Professor William Emery Brown had changed cars, and was continuing his journey. In his lap lay a volume of essays just put forth by a member of his craft, a college professor. He opened it. It chanced at page twenty-seven, and his eye was caught by the name of his own speciality. He read, "'Philosophy is the science which proves that we can know nothing of the soul. Medicine is the science which tells us that we know nothing of the body. Political economy is that which teaches that we know nothing of the laws of wealth, and theology the critical history of those errors from which we deduce our ignorance of God.' "'Confound it!' ejaculated professor brown and closed the book room for one more inquired a voice and the rubber tire man slid into the seat i just pulled off a little thing out there he said that ought to put a small star in my crown a down and out a tough looker says to me please mister give me a dime i'm hungry and i says to him get out what you want is a good drink go get it and slips him a quarter talk about gratitude to think there are men you know it and i know it and he was afraid of it who'd have steered him to a quick lunch and put him against soft boiled eggs man's inhumanity to man sure nothing but that ever makes me any trouble about things tear ninety george this to the conductor and burn this pantella some time you said you were in education he went on i've just blown myself to a universal history five big volumes with lots of maps and pictures and flags of all nations and hanging gardens of babylon and such things gave down thirty-five for it and my name is printed peter b squem on the first page of every book now mr squem grew quite earnest you'd say wouldn't you that if a man could take those books down chew them up you understand and take them down he'd have an education not the same of course as normal school or college and yet an education i think if you know what's good for you you will steer clear of what you call an education i think i should stick to rubber tires and a few comfortable certainties and peace mr squem stared how's that he inquired education is your line you were saying and yet you queer your stuff i'd get a quick word from the house if i handled mercury tires that way but you wouldn't rejoined professor brown you wouldn't because tires mean something tires are your life preserver they are shaped like life preservers aren't they you've got me going said mr squem and no mistake i don't mind telling you i'd hope to get some hunch from you on education you see my clothes are right i always have a room with a bath and i get two hundred a month and fifty on the side i read the papers and the magazine section on sunday and I got through four books last year, and yet there's something not there. By Kiefer, not there. I'd give something to get it there, to slide it under somehow, and bring the rest of me up to regular manicuring, and ice-cream forks, and the way my clothes fit. Mr. Squem was interrupted in the expression of this craving. There was a tremendous jar. The car tore and bumped with an immense pounding over the ties, then careened and sprawled down a short bank and settled on its side. People who have been through such an experience will require no description. To others none can be given. In the bedlam, chaos, and jumble, and chorus of shrieks and smashing glass, Professor Brown, struggling up through the bodies which had been hurled upon him, was conscious of a pain almost intolerably sharp in his leg, and then of a sort of striped whirlwind which seemed to be everywhere at once, extricating, calming, ordering, comforting, and swearing. It was like a machine-gun. "'Keep your clothes on. Nothing's gonna bite you. Just a little shake-up. Yes, chick, we'll find your ma. No, you don't climb over those people. Sit down or I'll help you. To hell with your valise. Pick up that child.' There go the axes. Everybody quiet now, just where he is. 
"'You with the side whiskers, get back! Back, you hear me? Now, children first, hand em along, women next, so, men last. Why didn't you say you was a doctor? Get out there quick. Some of those people have got broke and need you.' Professor Brown was one of these last. Lifted by Peter Squim and a very scared brakeman, he lay on two Pullman mattresses at the side of the track, waiting for the rabbit-faced country doctor to reach him. He was suffering very much. It seemed to him that he had never really known pain before. But his attention went to a white-haired lady nearby, a slight, slender woman with breeding written all over her. She had made her way from the drawing-room of the Pullman, and leaned heavily upon her maid in the state of approaching collapse. Professor Brown was impressed by her air of distinction even in the midst of his pain. Then he saw a striped arm supportingly encircle her, and a hand, dominated by an enormous seal-ring, pressed to her lips an open bottle of scotch. "'Let it trickle down, Auntie, right down. It's just what you need,' said Peter B. Squem. "'What did you think of when the car stopped rolling?' Professor Brown, lying in his bed, asked this question of Mr. Squem, sitting at its side. The latter had got the professor home to his house and his housekeeper after the accident the day before, and found the best surgeon in town and stood by while he worked, had in a dozen ways helped a bad business to go as well as possible, and now, having remained overnight, was awaiting the hour of his train. "'Think of! Nothing! No time! I was that cross-eyed boy you've heard about, the one at the three-ringed circus. Did you see that newlywed rooster? I'll bet he was that, the one with the celluloid collar. Good-bye, Maud, he yells, and then tries to butt himself through the roof. He wouldn't have left one sound rib in the car if I hadn't pinned him. No, I hadn't any time to think. He produced and consulted a watch, one that struck the professor as being almost too loud an ornament for a Christmas tree. An infant's face showed within as the case opened. "'Your baby?' inquired Professor Brown. "'Never. Not good enough. This kid I found, where do you suppose? On a picture postal at a newsstand. The picture was no good except the kid, and I cut him out, you see. Say, do you know the picture was painted by a man out in Montana? Yes, sir, Montana. They had the cards made over in Europe or somewhere. Dago's likely, and when they put his name on it, they didn't do a thing to that word Montana. Some spelling.' "'Why, what you have there,' said the professor, taking the watch with interest, "'is the holy child of Andrea Mantegna's circumcision. "'It's in the Uffizi at Florence. "'Singularly good it is, too. "'I'm very much wrapped up in the question, raised in a late book, "'of Mantegna's influence upon Giovanni Bellini. "'There's a rather fine point made in connection with another child in this same picture, "'a larger one pressing against his mother's knees.' Mr. Squem was perfectly uncomprehending. "'Come again?' he remarked. "'No, you needn't either, for I don't know anything about the rest of the picture. I told you it was no good. There was an old party in a funny bathrobe and with heavy Belshazzars, I remember. But the picture was this.' He rose and began to get into his overcoat. "'There's one thing about this kid,' he said in a casual tone, which somehow let earnestness through. "'I know a man.' He travels out of Philly, and he's some booze artist and other things that go along who's got one of those little Josephs, you know, those little dolls that Catholics tote around. Separate him from it? Not on your life. Why, he missed it one night on a sleeper, and he cussed and reared around and made the coon rout everybody out till he found it. It's luck, you see. Now this kid, Mr. Squem was pulling on his gloves, isn't luck, but he works like luck. He talks to me, understand, and here a pause. He puts all sorts of cussedness on the blink. You can't look at him and be an Indian. I was making the wrong sort of date in Trenton one day, and I saw him just in time. Sent the girl word I had been called out of town. I was figuring on the right time to pinch a man in the door. He'd done me dirty, and I saw him again. Good night. I'm never so punk that he doesn't ginger me. Doesn't look good to me. The management is mixed up with him, and I hook up to him. Here's the taxi. "'So long, Professor. Rats, I haven't done one little thing. Good luck to your game leg.' It was Sunday morning, and service was under way in the Church of the Holy Faith. For the thousandth time the Reverend Alan Dare had dearly beloved his people, assembled to the number of four hundred before him, 
exhorting them in such forthright English as cannot be written nowadays, not to dissemble nor cloak their sins before God, and to accompany him unto the throne of the heavenly grace. He had had a sick feeling, as he read this exhortation, so full of pound, rhythm, heart-search, and splendid good sense, to the courteous abstractedness in the pews. Heavens, he had a thought, once this burnt in. He had wanted to shriek, or fire a pistol in the air, and then crush the meaning into his people, crush God into them, yes, and into himself. He was four-tenths sag that morning, the Reverend Alan Dare. In the Jubilate, a small choir-boy, a phenomenon who was paid a thousand a year, and was responsible for the presence of not a few of the four hundred, had sung, be ye sure that the Lord he is God, to the ravishment of the congregation, not of the rector who stood looking dead ahead. The first lesson had been all about Jonadab, the son of Rechab, and drinking no wine, frightful ineptness. What could it mean to any one? How help any one? Here was life, with all its cruel tangles, tighter and more choking every day, here was Arnold's darkling plain, and the confused alarms, and the ignorant armies clashing by night. There came back to Dare the creed that he had heard in the smoking compartment. "'I think it ought to be run, the world, even if it's must up to the limit, and I think it's up to us to keep it running. I think there's a manager of it all in the central office, a manager, understand, though he never seems to show up around the works, and certainly does seem to have some of the darndest ways.' "'Oh, God,' breathed Alan Dare, "'there are so many things, so many things.' It was the same Sunday. Professor William Emery Brown was for the first time on crutches, and stood, supported by them, at his window. "'Back again,' he ruminated. "'I can probably drive to my classes in another week. Then the same old grind, showing ingenuous youth who fortunately will not see it, how the search hath taught me that the search is vain. Ho, oh, hum! How very kind, that Mr. Squem! He did so much for me, and how very funny! I should like to produce him at the seminar, with his just right clothes, his dream of culture via his universal history, his approach to reality through a picture-postal card. He turned on himself almost savagely, then, "'What the devil are you patronizing him for? Don't you see that he is hooked to something and you are not? That he is warm and you are freezing? That he is part of the wave, the wave, man? And that you are just a miserable tossing clot?' It was the same Sunday. Mr. Squem sat in his room, extremely denish, smitingly red as to walls, oppressive with plush upholstery. A huge deer-head jutted from over the mantel, divided honours with a highly-coloured September morn, affrontingly framed. On a shelf stood a small bottle. It contained a finger of Mr. Squem, amputated years before, in alcohol. On the knees of the owner of the room was volume one of the Universal History, number thirty-two, so red ink figures affirmed, of a limited edition of five hundred sets. Mr. Squem's name was displayed in very large Old English on the fly-leaf, and above was an empty oval wherein his portrait might be placed. "'No use,' soliloquized the owner of this treasure. "'No use. If I could chew it up and get it down, or two of it, that wouldn't slide under the thing that isn't there. Nothing will ever put me in the class of Professor Brown or that preacher on the car, or bring the rest of me up to my clothes.' He rose and stretched. "'Maybe,' he said, addressing a huge chocolate-coloured bust of an Indian lady, "'maybe I can catch up to those fellows some time, but not here. Noon, I bet,' looking at his watch, "'and it is to eat.' He contemplated the Mantegna baby. "'So long,' he said, "'you're running things,' and snapped his watch. End of story Biographical and Interpretive Notes by Charles Swain Thomas Reverend Arthur Russell Taylor, rector of the Episcopal Church at York, Pennsylvania, whose career as a writer of fiction opened so auspiciously with Mr. Squem, and a few companion stories, died very suddenly early in January, 1918. Here the central interest is in character. 
in creating such a personage as mr squem the writer of this story has boldly penetrated the veneer of culture and shown us that the character elements which are of enduring worth may be far aloof from any knowledge of art or religion or philosophy or any form of polite learning it is interesting to note the part which the railroad wreck plays in this story while there is enough in the situation to have made the wreck a point of central objective interest it is utilized here simply as the background for the display of mr squem genial direct efficient ingenious dominating interestingly crude in the february nineteen eighteen atlantic mr squem is equally interesting in a different environment soon after the death of rev arthur russell taylor bishop james henry darlington sent to the atlantic office as an interesting appreciation of dr taylor's work and character from bishop darlington we learn that dr taylor had for years been suffering from a tumour on the brain which had totally destroyed the sight of one eye and which by its pressure caused him constant pain sleepless nights and the gradual failing of the other eye like robert louis stevenson he was cheerful and brightened the lives of others until the very last and almost his final writings were sent to the atlantic End of section twenty three